In today's lecture I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, um by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. The main source of this pollution was from factories and it caused severe health problems. For example, a particularly severe smog in London in 1952 caused over 4,000 deaths. Obviously something had to be done and in 1956 a Clean Air Act was introduced in Britain. This addressed the pollution from factories and the smog soon disappeared. However, as you know, these days air pollution is still a big issue. The main difference between now and the 1950s is that you can't see it, it's invisible. Also, the main source of pollution now is from cars and lorries, and although these don't produce visible signs, this air pollution is still a significant risk to health. And one of the key factors in the rise of this type of pollution is that we have all become much more vehicle dependent. There are far more cars and lorries, trains and planes than in the 1950s and this is now the main source of air pollution around the world.
We have briefly looked at some of the problems involved in running a biggish city like, say, Melbourne, keeping the road and rail systems running, policing, providing food and housing, and so on. In another lecture, I'm going to deal with what is this now called, megalopolis, cities with populations of 10 million or more. However, first I want to go back in history to when the population of cities could be numbered in the thousands rather than millions. One of the earliest theorists of the city was, of course, Plato, who created an ideal city in his text, The Republic. The population of this city would be around 25 to 30,000 at most. Oddly enough, the same figures were chosen by Leonardo da Vinci for his ideal cities. Now, of these 25 to 30,000 inhabitants only about 5,000 would be citizens. A reason for this might be that it is the largest number that could be addressed publicly at one time and by one person, and makes a voting system much easier to manage. Also, perhaps the numbers are kept deliberately low because a large population would be harder to control, or because, in practical terms, fewer inhabitants are easier to feed from local supplies without having to depend on outside sources.
Paper mills had the worst of it for years as newspapers reduced pagination, went wholly digital or shut for good. The papers were able to hammer down the cost of newsprint from firms fighting for business as demand declined. Price-taking paper mills suffered in silence. Many hesitated to shut massive machines costing hundreds of millions of dollars. That hesitance has disappeared, mills are taking out newsprint capacity and diversifying. Norsky Skog, a Norwegian pulp and paper firm, said in June it would close its 66-year-old Tasman mill in New Zealand, for example. Many mills are converting machines to make packaging for e-commerce. UPM, a Finnish firm, announced this year the sale of its shot in newsprint mill in Wales to a Turkish maker of container board and packaging. For JCS Volga, a Russian mill, newsprint used to account for 70% of production, now half of what it makes is packaging. In this tutorial, we will show you how to find specific journal articles using the library catalog. The university subscribes over 18,000 journals across a variety of subjects, most of which are available electronically to find a specific journal article using a library catalog. Belief is the human capacity to imagine, to be creative, to hope and dream, to infuse the world with meanings, and to cast our aspirations far and wide. Limited neither by personal experience nor, material, reality. Believing is a, commitment, an investment, a devotion to possibilities. Beliefs, permeate, neurobiologies, bodies and ecologies acting as dynamic agents in evolutionary processes. The human capacity for belief, the, Specifics, of belief and I and our diverse belief systems shape, structure and alter our daily lives, our societies, and the world around us. Also, malaria is something that is a very complex disease with this complex life cycle. That means that if you're going to eliminate it, you have to be able to target cute parasites in humans. You have to be able to target parasites in the mosquitoes, that mosquito, population. And so that requires a lot of resources. It requires really good planning and a health system across all these different levels. And so I think the political capital that you need for that, the educational, infrastructure, you need for that, the economic resources you need for that are quite a challenge. Knowledge of the inheritance of characteristics has been implicitly used since prehistoric times for improving crop plants and animals through selective breeding. However, the modern science of genetics, which seeks to understand the mechanisms of inheritance, only began with the work of Gregor Mendel in the mid-19th century. Although he did not know the physical basis for the heredity, Mendel observed that inheritance is fundamentally a discrete process where specific traits are inherited in an independent manner. These basic units of inheritance are now called genes. Although genetics plays a large role in determining the appearance and behavior of organisms, it is the interactions of genetics with the environment, 
an organism experiences that determines the ultimate outcome. For example, while genes play a role in determining a person's height, the nutrition and health, that person experiences in childhood also have a large effect. Genetics, a discipline of biology, is the science of heredity and variation in living organisms. The year 2020 has been a tumultuous one for educators. Hundreds of thousands of teachers across the globe had to get to grips with online platforms to deliver their lessons. Millions of students were stuck at home doing their lessons via websites like Zoom. This has created an unprecedented transformation in education as technology has taken center stage. The quality of education differed around the world according to the quality of internet connections, the level of preparedness of teachers, and their competence in engaging with the technology. It also depended on what kind of devices students had at home. Many students were deprived of lessons because they had no computer, tablet or smartphone. Why do we have crime? When will it all stop? It's sad that there is so much crime in our society. It hurts so many people. Most people in the world just want to live happily and be good neighbors. Why do some people turn to crime? Money is a big reason. Many criminals pickpocket steal, kidnap or even kill people to get money. There are many terrible crimes in the world. Perhaps the worst is ethnic cleansing is a crime against humanity. Many people are killed because of their color or religion. People who commit this crime really go to prison. Have you ever been a victim of crime? What do you think we need to do to reduce crime rates? Perhaps you should run. Heritage is what the present chooses to make of the past. That means that heritage is dynamic. It's a changing concept. And it also means that it tends to be defined in opposition to much that is going on in the present. It's endangered. Where there is heritage, there is often a sense of threat, you know, whether it's a building that's about to be bulldozed or a way of life that is dying out because of economic change. The heritage that we speak about in this country in terms of conservation tends to be a term that becomes very central or more central in new ways as the state becomes involved in this field of administering conservation. Three years ago, genome pioneer Craig Venter sailed the Sargasso Sea and returned with 1,800 species of microbes, including 150 never before seen. An impressive haul. But last week, scientists in New York announced that if you want to discover new and interesting bugs, you need travel no further than your own forearm. The researchers, at the NYU School of Medicine, identified 182 species of bacteria, including a dozen new ones in swabs taken from the arms of six healthy volunteers. 
Their study marks the first full-scale expedition to catalog the biota that calls the human epidermis its home. The microbes that live in and on our bodies outnumber our own cells 10 to 1. So they're an important part of our personal ecology. And it turns out the zoo of bacteria on one person's skin is very different from the zoo on someone else's. Almost three quarters of the species identified were unique to an individual. And only four species were found on all six subjects. For the record, the researchers took their samples from the subject's forearms because that way no one had to undress. So who knows what exotic life forms may be waiting for discovery just behind your knees. I think with our linguistic training we also get all this invisible training to be authorities, to be the people who know. It is part of that process that you come out as a world authority on your chosen subject. But when we move into working with communities, we have to recognize that the communities have to be the authority in their language. Actually, a woman in the class I'm teaching at Sydney at the moment, a career woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else, she was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists, because of the training we do, have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language, but we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. I guess for me the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one person over another. That's not rocket science, it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place, so in a sense, the languages are still lost. If the authority is still lost. The night sky has always involved mystery and wonder. The library plays an important role in my academic career. History is not just a collection of dates and events. I would like all engineering students to raise their hands. <laughs> 